Thank you very much to uh, colleagues at RUSI. Uh, it is a real uh, privilege and pleasure for me to be uh, here this afternoon. Uh, as some of you know, uh, I am in my second last day uh, in this role, and uh, it is a wonderful opportunity to come here, of all places, uh, to reflect a bit on uh, the last three years that I've been doing this job uh, and where we now are. Um, as Charlie said, I will speak probably for about 25 minutes uh, maximum and then uh, look forward to the questions and answers. I hope I won't be defensive. I'm not, uh, I'm not known for that. Uh, and that part may very well be the most interesting part of, uh, of our session. Unlike people in far too many countries, most UK citizens continue to go about their lives safely and largely unaffected by the impact or even the possibility of terrorism. But the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland sadly has had almost continuous experience of the horror and fear of terrorism in the last uh, 45 years and of course sporadically for long before. Indeed, just over 130 years ago, a bomb was detonated outside uh, Great Scotland Yard. Um, many, if not all of you, will know that is about 100 yards from here, uh, then the headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, uh, and it destroyed the Rising Sun pub and started a small fire at the offices of the newly formed Special Irish Branch, which had been formed three years earlier in response to the Fenian uh, so-called campaign. And that same night, two other bombs exploded at the Junior Carlton Club and at the home of Sir Watkins Williams Wynne, a Conservative politician. And a fourth was planted at the foot of Nelson's Column, uh, but did not explode. So really from that day to this, Scotland Yard has been engaged, more or less, in counter-terrorist -ter policing. And the threat to the UK, as you know, and to UK interests is real and enduring. Arguably, it is now as complex as it has been, uh, certainly in my lifetime. I'm going to talk a bit about the threats as we see them in policing, something about the events and changes of the last few years. In so doing, I hope to give a, a small flavour of how policing fits into the wider efforts to counter terrorism. And then I will finish uh, by describing some of our current challenges uh, as I see them. We currently view the threat uh, in a number of categories. Firstly, international terrorism uh, posed by AQ and AQ affiliates and inspired groups and individuals and groups that have broken off from that. In the current climate, it is worth noting that the assessment of the threat here is substantial. That is one level below where we have been, for example, in almost all of the first 10 years of the 2000s. It does still mean that an, an attack is a strong possibility, but we are not at severe and we are not at critical as we were for much of the early 2000s. Secondly, Northern Irish related terrorism. It never ceases to amaze me how little the ongoing difficulties and attacks in Northern Ireland feature in international and indeed uh, Great British over here media. Of course things are so very much better than they were at the height of what we call the Troubles. Nevertheless, the police there deal very regularly indeed with attempts at horrendous murderous attacks, including executions with firearms, pipe bombs, and other improvised devices, mortar attacks, and large bombs. A majority have been aimed at the police, at the military, uh, and the prison service. Some, of course, apparently uh, at businesses and members of the public. Through fantastic work, thankfully, very few so far in the last few years have been successful, but sadly, some have. Thirdly, like many countries, we have a threat from what we call, sometimes perhaps slightly confusingly here, domestic extremists. Violent extremists, particularly from uh, currently the extreme right wing, people who hate, hate groups such as Muslims, Jews, gays and other minorities. 
These are mostly individuals or sometimes very small groups. Some of the people who espouse this have mental health problems. Some are quite young. We in the police quite often discover them as they are experimenting uh, with explosives or seeking to procure firearms. Finally, I think I should say that London, as um, perhaps the most diverse city on the planet, and that's why so many of us live here and work here and love being here, occasionally hosts those who support a wide range of uh, terrorist causes not uh, related to Al-Qaeda, focused actually in and on other countries. And these people may be engaged in fundraising, facilitation, incitement, very occasionally attack planning. And I remind you here of the horrible attack uh, on an elderly visiting Indian general. Uh, he was in the UK privately with his wife. His throat was cut. Um, thankfully, he survived. He was just walking in, <coughs> excuse me, in a central London street and he was attacked by a group of young British Sikh men. We identified them, brought them to justice. He was a great witness. Uh, they're now convicted and sentenced. Knowing that the UK is a highly attractive target for terrorists, we have, I believe, built some considerable expertise and invested very heavily, particularly since 2005, to protect our borders, our national infrastructure, crowded places, iconic sites, to ensure we are effectively prepared should the worst happen, to identify those who pose us a threat from within and abroad and be able to disrupt them and, where possible, bring them to justice, and perhaps the greatest challenge, to try to prevent people from becoming radicalised and attracted to violent extremism. I'm very happy in the questions and answers to talk about uh, our work in relation to any of those uh, aspects. Here I'll just emphasise three quick points. Firstly, um, those that know me will know I'm not uh, a very big fan of the overused term strategy, um, but I do think it is worth noting that the contest strategy though not perfect, has been remarkably successful. It has lasted a long time. It has been amended uh, to some extent on uh, three particular occasions. It has brought together a wide range of people uh, in agencies, in government departments, in the military, uh, in the police, in business, in uh, our public. It has brought us together with a sense of common purpose, a language that we can all understand, the ability to challenge each other regularly about our understanding and our efforts, and uh, a joint understanding of threat and risk. We genuinely have a community of effort, and when I am fortunate enough to speak to people from other countries, uh, I think uh, we have uh, one of the best communities of counter-terrorist effort uh, in the world. In the police, there has been massive investment, uh, not least in uh, interoperability. And this has led to the building of a network which has the, the ability to surge and to flex according to where the threat, uh, the risk, the demand is around the country. We have officers and staff across the country who speak the same language, who've been trained together, who have the same IT, who can work together even though they come from different forces, and who are uh, coordinated and brigaded on occasion uh, by the centre and by uh, my deputy, the senior national coordinator. This uh, network, which uh, functions locally, regionally, nationally and internationally, um, is not completely perfect. It is a work in action and we are still working on it. But if I look back to when I joined the police and somebody had said to me 30 years ago that we would be able to collaborate and coordinate and manage ourselves collectively across the different threats and risks that are faced across the country in this manner, I would not have believed it. In fact, I probably wouldn't have believed it 15 years ago. Bringing police forces in this way has, uh, together has been described um, by, uh, by me on several occasions as a challenge when we were looking forward, a little bit like NATO, 
or the UN. But actually, what we have is a functioning network uh, which is extraordinarily capable. And the whole show depends on our linkages with local policing. So in police forces around the country, there are firearms teams, there are surveillance teams, there are intelligence officers working locally upon whom we depend. There are community officers who have an absolutely fundamental role in countering terrorism. And all of these are doing general police work and anti-terrorist work. Uh, so I think of it as, you know, uh, whether it's a little finger, an arm, half of them, all of them, there is a proportion of all our officers who are engaged in supporting the counter-terrorist effort. And we have an incredibly good linkage from them up to uh, the regional level. There are also specialist counter-terrorist officers who are deployed locally. Um, they might be providing security advice, for example, in the government security zone. Uh, they might be doing particular aspects of prevent work or other uh, supporting community work. They might be doing uh, local investigations or intelligence work. And then above them we have the regional units and then the national units, those things which are best done nationally, whether that's coordination, uh, doing um, financial investigations, a whole swathe of things are best done nationally and so they are, mostly in London but not exclusively. Some of our national units are in other parts of the country as well. And uh, my post holder and my deputy are able to call on all of that and get information and intelligence very quickly from the community officer up to the centre and out, if necessary, internationally to make decisions on behalf of chief constables across the country about where we will together put our effort. And when we're making those decisions, there are sort of three things that are always in our minds uh, if we are dealing with people who we believe may pose a threat. The first and overriding thing is public safety. We will always prioritise public safety. Secondly, we in the police seek to bring people to justice if they are committing offences whenever we can. And thirdly, we seek to maintain or improve the confidence of our communities. And these three things, public safety in the centre, bringing people to justice and community confidence, are all linked all the time. Very occasionally, we have to intervene because we fear the public are at risk before we are confident that we would be able to bring people to the point of charge. This doesn't happen very often, but it occasionally does happen, and we will do that. And we are alert to the fact that that may lead to a reduction in community confidence certainly uh, in the short term. Um, but we will always be seeking to improve uh, the confidence of our communities and in particular the confidence of those communities uh, who feel most threatened or are most vulnerable to uh, the risk of terrorism. Another aspect of the way we've built our work is partnership, a much overused word, uh, but we do not take a step in counter-terrorist policing without uh, some of our partners depending on the scenario. I could go on and on, I'll just mention two. We work extremely closely at the moment with NOMS to help them counter the threat of uh, radicalisation and extremism in prisons and also to allow us to manage the risk of those who are released from prison who've been convicted of terrorist offences. We work incredibly closely with the Crown Prosecution Service. They are separate but they come in and advise us at an early stage of our investigations and we have a very collaborative relationship right up to the point of, uh, of sentencing. Now, as you will know, I am qualified, uh, if at all, to talk uh, about counter-terrorist policing and not the work of our intelligence agencies. But it would be wrong of me uh, not to stress the very, very important aspect of our modern UK model which is that the police work is uh, integrated very closely indeed with the security service and indeed the whole apparatus of government counter-terrorist efforts. This can obviously be a fine balancing act as the police in the UK have a proud history of operational independence and a constitutional position separate from government and parliament. 
And as with any partnership, it's important that proper challenge is possible, that differences are respected, and clarity of command and decision-making is maintained. We have different functions, different powers, different accountabilities, but our relationship now is stronger than ever before. And I think stronger than any relationship between the police and uh, an intelligence agency around the world. And I believe that that has been a fundamental pillar under contest of keeping this country safe. You will know that from 2005, when we suffered those terrible attacks on London's uh, public transport system, to 2012, we had no losses of innocent life from terrorist attacks in, Great in, in England and Wales or Scotland. In every year since 2001, we, the big we, have prevented at least one major terrorist attack on the UK through good intelligence work and effective joint working. These partnerships that I've talked about extend increasingly internationally. Very, very few of our investigations do not have a significant international dimension. In addition, the police work very closely with security professionals in businesses, with communities and community organisations like the Community Security Trust, which protects our Jewish communities. It is this model of the police working closely with communities, businesses, agencies and internationally which worked so well to keep our Olympic Games safe and to help our visitors uh, feel very safe. Inevitably, the threat we have faced has been changing and it continues to do so. And this is obvious to all of you. Uh, I will perhaps illustr illustrate uh, with some examples from the last three years. Internationally, many countries have become much more dangerous for UK missions, companies and travellers. We've had a number of UK citizens kidnapped by terrorists in, for example, Nigeria, Somalia, Ken Kenya. Sadly, some have lost their lives. Metropolitan police officers have been deployed to assist the local authorities in many of these cases and were, of course, deployed to Algeria after the Inaminas siege and murders in which uh, British companies were victims, British citizens were killed, uh, and many more were kidnapped. <coughs> we also, as you may know, deployed to Kenya in the wake of the Westgate attack by marauding firearms terrorists to mentor and support their investigators, their forensic retrieval, and sadly, their victim identification. We continue to see threats to the UK uh, linked to Pakistan and Afghanistan, also from Somalia, Yemen, and now, of course, from some other countries. We sometimes see UK citizens travelling to these places, apparently to fight or to train. Some such people will no doubt stay. Some, sadly, will be killed. There are many other possibilities, of course, to return and lead peaceful lives, to return and start radicalising and recruiting others, to wait for a signal to take some action, or to self-organise to an attack plan. Most recently, in common with some other European countries, we've seen many people travelling to Syria, some with the best of humanitarian purposes, others travelling for so-called jihad. Syria does appear to be different. It appears to be highly attractive and iconic for travellers. And this terrible conflict takes place in the age of social media. Hence, we have highly emotive, provocative, and inflammatory messaging, which conflate and confuse historical and religious e issues, leading to a particular sense of injustice. You will know that in the last few years, we've had a number of networks of British Muslim men convicted of planning attacks within the UK. One group were arrested, having begun to create peroxide-based devices. Others had identified targets such as military barracks and iconic sites in London. Another group travelled from the Midlands to the north of the country armed with a firearm and improvised devices with the intention of attacking a rally organised by a right-wing group. All of these were brought to justice before they were able to harm anyone. Many others have also been brought to justice through a variety of terrorist-related offences. They include, uh, for example, a Muslim couple, not apparently part of a network, but heavy readers of int internet extremist material who seem to be planning to bomb synagogues and Jewish premises. 
As I've said, every year since 2001, we've disrupted at least one major attack planning plot. Since then, there have been over 370 convictions of terrorist offences and many, many others of people we know to be supporters of violent extremism who we have convicted for non-terrorist crime offences. The tempo of arrests, charges and convictions continues to this day. I think we can reasonably summarise these trends for the UK as fewer larger networks intent on spectacular large-scale attacks requiring considerable planning. Fewer obviously receiving command and control from elsewhere. More self-organised or self-tasked groups. Perhaps more lone actors, looser networks. More self-radicalised and or radicalised largely from the internet. And internationally, a wider range of countries from whence threat may come. AQ senior leadership and core have clearly been significantly denuded, but the brand, its associates and those it has inspired are still powerful and pervasive. And for the UK, that creates a threat which is more diverse and more diffuse. Last year, we saw two sets of utterly appalling events in the UK. Firstly, the dreadful killing of Lee Rigby, an off-duty soldier, brutally attacked by two men in the South London street just over a year ago and shortly after uh, the attack in Boston. You will be fully aware that two British men, Adebowale and Adebolajo, were convicted of this horrendous murder. And secondly, uh, in the Midlands, three separate IEDs containing nails were left near mosques. A Ukrainian man recently arrived in the UK was convicted in connection with these attacks and with the murder of an elderly Muslim man, Mr. Salim, who was stabbed in the street. For some in our Muslim and other minority communities, this has raised the spectre of the possibility of minorities being targeted by individuals travelling from countries where extreme racist attitudes appear much more entrenched than they are in the UK. Both these sets of crimes in London and the Midlands resulted in outrage quite properly and they did raise tensions in our communities, which in turn, you will remember, resulted in extra policing to provide protection and security and also to police prot political protests. I believe also, though, that they showed some of the success of uh, policies over the last several years designed to increase integration and intercommunity understanding and cohesion. So, for example... The murder of Mr Rigby was roundly and loudly condemned by a wide range of Muslim leaders in a manner we might not have expected a few years before. Despite the best efforts of the people who carried out the attacks and some people who subsequently tried to exploit the incidents to spread fear, suspicion and hatred, the population in the UK seemed remarkably resilient, integrated and calm, as I have to say it generally has uh, in all the major incidents that we have dealt with uh, since 9-11. There is no room for complacency here, of course, and in uh, the age of very fast communications, uh, myths can be spread very quickly, misunderstandings and hatred can be, per can be promulgated very quickly. Uh, we all need to be very alert uh, to the potential for uh, community tension and indeed uh, perhaps uh, disorder should we suffer future attacks. You will note, and probably you will know, that these, uh, these trends, these simpler, less sophisticated crimes by self-organised or lone actors of whatever motivation, are by definition in some ways harder to detect or to tackle through some of our intelligence techniques. In the UK, we have to depend more on families, schools, friends, health professionals, employers, observing changes in behaviour and having the confidence to come forward. We do have frequent examples of this, but we also have many examples of warning signs being missed, ignored or not brought to the attention of the authorities. And perhaps we don't have quite the levels of alertness that there are in some countries, although I do believe that we have so many good citizens who every day report to the anti-terrorist hotline uh, or to their local police suspicious items and behaviours. It's a truism, but I do believe ultimately within the UK it will be communities that defeat terrorism. And it remains our greatest challenge to support the development of communities that are wholly hostile to violent extremism 
and to be able to identify, support and protect those who are vulnerable to radicalisation. In this context, the challenge of Syria has been and can be positive as well as negative. Six weeks ago, uh, we ran a nationwide engagement uh, and media campaign designed to raise awareness of the dangers of travelling and encourage people to contact us with their concerns. This campaign continues and we are regularly receiving information from worried families, friends and institutions about those intending or believed to have travelled and those who appear vulnerable to radicalisation. Syria means we are making a record numbers, record numbers of referral to Channel uh, and many of you will be familiar with Channel uh, and it is one of several uh, diversionary schemes that we have to try to assist in turning people away from the path of radicalisation and towards violent extremism, that we try to turn them away from both. Syria has meant that we have started new conversations with and in communities and we must build on that. We in the police are convinced that extremist preachers not only divide communities and create an atmosphere that can lead to violence and disorder, but that some target vulnerable people, encouraging them to turn to violence and terrorism. We do everything in our power to disrupt their activities and where they break the law to bring them to justice. But we also need communities to stand up to them and reject them. Again, I believe the horrors of Syria and Iraq can be used to good effect. The daily awful news stories underline the scale of the challenge and are, I believe, reducing complacency and passivity. Meanwhile, my officers and counter-terrorist officers around the country, dedicated, capable professionals, more skilled, better equipped than they ever have been, are working in an environment which is, in some other ways, also challenging. Firstly, I hope you will agree we have high levels of public confidence in our ability to tackle terrorism. All our surveys show us that. I believe we have a very good record of using our very considerable power sensitively and in a way that maintains confidence and encourages people to give us intelligence and evidence. And we have certainly worked very hard at this in the last few years. We are acutely aware that counter-terrorist policing done badly can have a negative effect leading to alienation, radicalisation, loss of confidence and ultimately, of course, loss of legal powers. Nevertheless, we are seeing some of our techniques degraded by the day, particularly in the sphere of communications data. At a conference last week, I described this as staring into the abyss. And in the atmosphere of a very lively debate about where the balance between individual liberty and security should lie, there are, of course, some other challenges to our powers and techniques. In particular, there has been concern about surveillance, about CCTV, about biometric and other personal data retained by the authorities. In law enforcement, we regard these as fundamental to our abilities to tackle crime, to keep people safe and to tackle terrorism. But, of course, we also recognise and respect the fact that ultimately the decision about where the line should be drawn, if you are trying to balance liberty and security, trying to balance privacy and safety, th these, this decision is not for cops. We understand that totally. It's for the public and for our politicians. And our job is to use our formidable powers judiciously and sparingly and to explain our actions and our professional views when appropriate. Secondly, our decisions are scrutinised more in Parliament, the courts and in the media, to name but a few. Accountability is fundamental to our democracy, but uh, the multiplicity of requests and a relentless looking backwards can, you will understand, be sapping of leadership and of morale. In counter-terrorism, there's a particular challenge for accountability in that much of the information and te techniques that we rely on is secret and or is not ours to disclose. Policing benefits hugely from having the confidence of our agencies, our intelligence agencies and our foreign partners. The public benefit from us having both overt and covert, secret and open capabilities. But operating in these different spheres does mean that many different bodies want a part of us. They want our account. 
and some are not likely to be happy or satisfied when I say I can't tell you. What we should be doing though, and I think we have been doing, is to seek to explain ourselves wherever we can, be as open as possible and continue to tackle the myths and conspiracy theories that can and do surround counter-terrorism. A further challenge for us all is our ability to work effectively internationally, to share and protect intelligence, to make decisions about jurisdiction and assistance quickly, to follow people, money and illicit goods fast and effectively. Some countries are becoming hostile and dangerous. In some others, the human rights record makes it difficult for us to work effectively with them. Finally, highly sensitive techniques used by our intelligence agencies and international partners are being, it seems, uh, I almost said almost daily, but I think that is an exaggeration, nevertheless often exposed by activists, journalists, spies, and what we would once have called traitors, and on occasions by governments themselves. This conference comes at an extraordinary time for the intelligence communities, uh, particularly in the US and the UK. Now, I am thankfully neither qualified nor authorised to talk about uh, their capabilities or indeed intelligence more broadly. In CT policing, we have not rested on our laurels. As well as improving our capability, including areas such as cyber and digital forensics and our interoperability, we have recently been undertaking some detailed reviews of our business to improve our efficiency, to ensure we have resources in the right places geographically, to ensure we collaborate effectively with colleagues in the National Crime Agency and in organised crime policing, and also to improve our governance and our work with, for example, the police and crime commissioners. This work, I believe, will stand us in very good stead should the Home Secretary announce a review of CT policing arrangements. I believe such a review will be thorough and evidence-based. We will play a full part in it and we have nothing to fear from it. Whenever it happens, it would be an entirely logical step to have such a review. I don't, the Home Secretary doesn't need me to tell her that, but I think it is an entirely logical step, nine years after 7-7, given the huge investment the changing threats uh, and uh, the arrival of police and crime commissioners, the College of Policing and the National Crime Agency. The landscape has changed. Whatever the result, and there are some arguments for various models, including, as I prefer, refining the current arrangements, I believe we must maintain some fundamental principles, including maintaining the legitimacy and confidence in the overall CT effort done so effectively by our frontline officers. Harnessing and building the capabilities in communities to fight terrorism. Supporting and enhancing the partnership between the security service and the police. Working effectively locally, nationally and internationally. Any change must support, I believe, these critical aspects. For myself, as I said last week, I have seen no compelling case for change to a model where the NCA leads the CT law enforcement effort in the uh, near future. This is an extraordinary time, of course, uh, in the history of North Africa and the Middle East. As we watch the ghastly events in Syria and Iraq unfolding, it's very hard to know, for some of us um, sitting here in our largely comfortable lives, with good security, a working democracy, a free press, lots of you here, and a largely functioning and incorruptible criminal justice system, what the effects of these extraordinary events will be in the long time. For counter-terrorism, I believe that the model we have developed here of recognisable, accountable police working in local communities and regionally, nationally and internationally and in trusted partnerships is a formidable capability and a model fit for the threats and risks we face uh, in the future. I'll finish by reminding you that um, Jonathan Evans, uh, most distinguished, recently retired Director General of the Security Service, said, people paid to think about the future from a security perspective always tend to conclude that future threats are more complex, unpredictable and alarming. And after a very long and distinguished service, he concluded that that is rarely the case. 
It looks like it when you're looking forward, but it is, in his view, rarely the case. My personal view, and obviously I speak to the Director General often, is that for the UK now, it is really quite a complex picture. As I've said, the threats are more diverse, they're more diffuse. Despite all our best efforts, our formidable capability, there is still much we don't understand, and we cannot and should not pretend we can reduce the risks of terrorist attacks to zero. But we can and must continue to learn, to avoid complacency, to fight terrorism with all our skills and power. And in so doing, we must show courage, endurance and determination. Thank you very much. Thank you.